My name is Michael Seidman. I am a surgeon, scientist, and nutritionist. I trained at the University of Michigan where I got my undergraduate degree in human nutrition and my medical degree also from the University of Michigan. I did my residency in otolaryngology head and neck surgery, the fancy name for ear, nose, and throat surgery at uh, Henry Ford Health System. And then I did my fellowship in otologic, neurologic, and skull base surgery at the Ear, Researcher, the ear Research Foundation in Florida. Um, I worked at Henry Ford Health System for more than 30 years. I have multiple NIH grants, do a lot of research, and Florida Hospital recruited me here to lead their skull base surgery division and to lead wellness. This video is about eustachian tube dysfunction, and I want to talk to you a bit about that because it's a very common problem. It basically causes pressure and fullness in the ear. It may cause fluid inside the ear. It can cause a muffled sensation in the ear. It can cause a lot of issues for people. And so if we look at this diagram here, this will help explain where the problem is. This is your head cut in half. This is the external ear. This is where wax is in your ear canal. Don't use Q-tips. Up to the eardrum, in this way, make up the external auditory canal. The middle ear starts on the inside surface of the eardrum, and it consists of the three smallest bones in your body, the malleus, incus, and stapes, also known as the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. It's normally an air-containing space that connects to the back of the nose via the eustachian tube, and every time a normal person opens and closes their mouth, the eustachian tube opens and closes a little tiny bit and equalizes pressure inside the middle ear space. What you need to know is this area here is the narrow spot, and it's less than about a millimeter in diameter, and if you look at the white part of my fingernail, that's about a millimeter in diameter. The inner ear starts on the inside surface of this third bone of hearing, and it consists of the cochlea, which is the snail shell shaped organ responsible for hearing, and the semicircular canal is responsible for balance. And then there are nerves here, and this is where some of the tumors are that I remove called acoustic neuromas. So it's interesting when you look at the eustachian tube, um, it is mucosally lined just like the inside of your mouth or the inside of your nose, um, and that's called mucosa. And so what happens is if you get a cold or if you have allergies, this mucosa swells. So just, you, you know you all had a cold and your nose feels stuffy. The same thing is happening in the eustachian tube. And it shouldn't take rocket science to understand that if this tube gets blocked, it's a millimeter in diameter, uh, just from a cold or from allergies, you now have air trapped in the middle ear space with no place to go. So the cells inside the middle ear space, middle ear space resorb that air and it causes negative pressure, and we can see that the eardrum gets sucked inward. You can get enough negative pressure that fluid starts to dump in here, and then that fluid can get infected, and you can get an acute ear infection. And what's interesting is it sounds like I've described a month-long process, but the process of this going from a blocked eustachian tube to negative pressure to fluid in the ear to an infection can happen in about two hours with kids, pretty rapid. So we've had a good medical management for people with eustachian tube dysfunction for years and it's very important to try medical management before jumping to surgery. I always tell patients the best medicine is no medicine, the best surgery is no surgery. That being said, we obviously do lots of both when necessary. And so the medical management is to give you a nasal steroid spray, Flonase, Rhinocort, Nasacort, whichever. And what that does is it helps shrink the inside of the nasal mucosa and it helps you equalize pressure. Then I tell people to pop their ears 10 to 20 times a day. So you'll see people on planes do it, I'm a scuba diver. You pinch your nose, you close your mouth, and you blow. And what you're doing is you're forcing air back up the eustachian tube to equalize the pressure inside the ear. Um, I also tell people to add an antihistamine or decongestant, uh, or a combination is probably best, such as Claritin D, Zyrtec D, or Allegra D, whatever is least expensive. That also helps decongest the inside of the nose and facilitates popping of the ears and normal function of the eustachian tube. You can't use it if you have high blood pressure, or you can as long as you check with your doctor or you're monitoring your blood pressure because it can raise it just a little bit. The other thing besides um, common colds is, is allergies. And so if you've not been seen by an allergist, even if you don't think you have allergies, you might want to consider that route. So we've never had anything good for kids who have recurrent ear infections. We've always just put tubes inside their ears, and you've seen you know, many kids have had tubes, and many adults have this problem too. And until recently, my, my close colleague and friend, Dennis Poe at the Mass Eye and Ear, um, a man of great integrity, developed a procedure where you can slide a balloon in the eustachian tube and balloon dilate it. 
The long story short is we think that this works about 70% of the time. It doesn't work for everybody, but it's an option in case we don't want to put in your ninth or tenth set of tubes. And so the logic is we slide a balloon in, we dilate it for two minutes, and 12 atmospheres of pressure, and I'll show you what that balloon looks like in just a moment. And people always ask me, well, how will I know that this worked for me? My answer is if the patients had eight or nine sets of tubes and I'm putting in their tenth set of tubes um, because they have fluid again, I'll put tubes in, I'll balloon dilate, and I say when the tubes fall out in six to 12 months on average, if you don't need your 11 set of tubes, we know that this worked. And the procedure reportedly now works in about 70% of patients. This is what it looks like, just so you can see it. This is the ERA system, uh, which was the first one on the block. Uh, there are a couple of options for us here. Um, and what I do is with you asleep, although some people will do this with you awake, but it's really challenging to numb this up and takes a good hour almost to numb this up in the office. So we usually relegate this to the operating room and it's a pretty quick procedure, but we go through the nose and we slide to the opening of the eustachian tube right there, which is, correlates with the end over here. So I'm gonna move here now, and then once we're at the right end, we slide this in like this, and then I actually dilate this balloon, or inflate it, and, and what I do is this, and it goes up to 12 atmospheres of pressure. The nurse does this in the operating room while we're doing this. We get it up to 12 atmospheres of pressure. The balloon is sitting in the eustachian tube. We leave it in for two minutes. After two minutes, I let the water out, slide it back, come back out, and I do the opposite side. So it doesn't take very long to do the actual procedure. So the primary risks that you need to know about are, are several. Um, bleeding and infection, usually not very common. Sometimes a little bit of soreness in the nose or the mouth from the anesthesia part. Um, it is rare, but it's possible that I can't get back inside here because of a septum which separates the right side of the nose from the left side of the nose. The septum can be crooked so bad that I can't get in there, but sometimes I can put the balloon on one side and the camera that I use on the other side, but sometimes it's so plastered that we have to have your septum fixed first, but I can see that preoperatively that it'll usually be a problem. I have only had it happen once where I thought that I could get in there and I got back there and I couldn't get into the right spot. So it's possible that that happens as well. And I've seen this particularly in very large people where they have uh, uh, multiple folds in the back of the nose. It almost looks like a Sharpay dog, if you can imagine that. So it's like what's behind door number one, two, three, four. They have all these little slits there and, and none of them seem to go anywhere. So you can have a false passage and that's an issue. And you can also have overcorrection. So if this over dilates, you can actually get an overcorrection. I've only had that happen once in probably more than a couple of hundred patients that we've operated on now. And that got better after several weeks to several months. Dr. Poe has told me he's had one patient that it was permanent. I've not had that happen yet. And I hope it doesn't happen because it's annoying. You sort of hear yourself speak in your ear. It's called autophony, an echoing kind of a sound. And probably the scariest risk that I briefly mentioned in Europe, we saw this is, you can see this here. This is actually the eustachian tube here, but there's the internal carotid artery. So in our world, um, it's close. Um, and in this case, there's a situation with it as well. And the carotid artery is much closer to here. So the way that they've set up their device is they keep you away from there. But there's always that theoretical risk that we have to be concerned about. Um, all in all, this is a very straightforward procedure. And, and I think you'll do great. And I can tell you that 70% of the people are happy they had this done. Um, so I wanted to show you a couple of uh, slides here because people always ask me how this works. So this is the mucosa of the lining of the eustachian tube. And then you can see that this is the pre-dilation, this is the post. It basically smashes these three or four cell layers and long term it looks something like that. So it tends to open up the eustachian tube. Now I'll tell you, I was very skeptical of Dennis, and uh, you know he's a fellow uh, aviator. I'm a pilot. He's a pilot, and we were flying one day, and we were talking about this, and I said, "Come on, Dennis, this really can't work, can it?" And I, my analogy that I use is a little bit like this: if this is wallpaper on a wall, and I'm pushing really hard, am I really accomplishing anything? And they now, with the, the slides I show you, now have about 10 years of study and data to show that it does help 70% of the patients. I want to close with telling you about three patients, just as example, two are home run success 
one is not. And so I had this one patient come to me from Tampa, Florida. He's a diver professionally, spear dives, and had a really hard time equalizing only his left ear. He's had this his entire life. He had heard about the procedure. He had heard about me. He came down from Tampa. I balloon dilated him, and a week after that, I think I made him not dive for about a week or two, about a week after that, he went diving, sent me a picture with a spearfish, said no problems, and he's been diving happily ever after without a single problem. So that's a home run. He's happy, I'm happy. I have another patient who flew to me from New York. She's a young lady who travels around the world for work, and she can't get on a plane, but she does, and she cries because she has horrible pain because she can't equalize the pressure in her ears. So she wanted to try this. She flew down on a Tuesday. I did this on a Wednesday. She flew home Thursday, and she sent me a beautiful thank you note saying she's had no problem, and she's now been flying for about a year without any problems whatsoever, and she's thrilled which leads me to the concept of will this work forever and so most of the time we think people need this dilation done once there are certainly people who've had it repeated after a couple of years and a few that have lasted even longer uh, according to a lot of the studies that Dennis Poe has done the last patient I'll tell you is a physician who came to me and this is a person who I wasn't really excited about doing it who has terrible sinus disease has had multiple sets of tubes which most of the patients have and he had horrible allergies and I said uh, look you know we can try this and it may or may not work but he wanted me to try it and he would always get glue like fluid in his ears so I basically took him to the operating room a bit reluctantly did his 15th set of tubes thick glue suctioned that out got in his nose I knew he had polyps everywhere it was really kind of challenging I balloon dilated and for him I did nothing so I felt bad um, but it, even for people who I think are good candidates, we think that this works in about 70% of patients. Um, the risks, just in conclusion, again, I think I briefly mentioned them, are bleeding from the nose, bleeding from the mouth, overcorrection, it's near the carotid, so that's always a concern for us, and, and the long-term studies show that this works about 70% of time for people. So. I think it's something that we can do and it's helpful. We do see people who have what we call atelectasis or an eardrum that's just so sucked down onto the second and third bones of hearing that there's erosion there. And that's an end stage problem. And even if I dilate this, it may or may not help. So I'm not typically wild about doing it for those patients unless they're very highly motivated for those types of things. Um, I think that's it, and I'd like to come in and uh, answer any questions that you might have, and I appreciate you uh, taking the time and watching this YouTube video. Thanks so much.